organization called Schaffer Consulting. And he's an internationally recognized consultant, executive coach, speaker on organizational transformation, uh, post-merger integration and sim simplification. His clients have included many of the Fortune 500 companies, as well as prominent financial government and non-profit organizations. He was part of the original team that collaborated with the then CEO of GE, Jack Welsh, to develop the GE Workout program. Uh, which is about creating a faster, simpler, and more nimble organization. He also helped GE to develop uh, GE Capital's approach to acquisition migration. He's the author of other books, Simply Effective, uh, How to Cut Through Complexity in Your Organization and Get Things Done, as well as the co-author of Rapid Results with Robert Schaffer. The GE Workout with Dave Ulrich and Steve Kerr, the Boundless Organization with Dave Ulrich, Steve Kerr, and Todd uh, Jick in 1995, which is 20 years, and the Boundless, Organ Boundless Organization Field Guide in 1999. So the fact that the Boundless Organization started in 1995, we were thinking about Boundless around that time, or the, 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 the beginnings of it were emerging, is why we're going to look at that right now and see where we've come from, where we're going to, and the transformation that's happened with um, organizations, including our own. So in addition to his books, Ron's publications include dozens of articles. He's a regular blogger for the Harvard Business Review and Forbes. So now if we can uh, do it, I'd like to uh, run the video uh, of Ron just introducing himself. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ron Ashkenaz. I'm a senior partner at Schaefer Consulting. And as some of you may have astutely perceived, I'm not actually in Edinburgh. I'm right now in Stamford, Connecticut, and I'm recording this video as an introduction to the session that uh, we'll be having now with uh, Alan Brown and myself. Uh, as an introduction to this session, let me just say that about uh, 25 years ago, I had the opportunity to work with Jack Welch and a team of other people at GE as part of the transformation of GE. And one of the key terms that Jack Welch started to use then was the boundaryless organization. He wanted to make GE a boundaryless organization. We didn't quite know what that meant at the time, but we listened patiently and we worked on the transformation. <coughs> and gradually over time, we began to see that there was a tremendous amount of insight and, uh, and wisdom in that terminology. Uh, eventually, as we made progress at GE, uh, several colleagues and I decided to write a book about what boundaryless would mean. And we, we wrote the first edition of the Boundaryless Organization, which came out in 1995, which is actually 20 years ago. So since then, uh, Alan and the Open Group have used boundaryless information flow as a, a key principle for what the Open Group stands for. And in preparation for this conference, Alan and I were talking and thinking it might be useful to do a 20-year retrospective on what was the origin of the notion of boundaryless organization and boundaryless information flow, and how does it fit today? Today, the world is very different. We have all kinds of communications technologies. It's possible to talk to anyone anywhere in the world and to have the, the internet and the information flow. So do we still need to talk about boundaryless organization and boundaryless information flow? So that's the purpose of the discussion this morning, is to see where were we 20 years ago? How has the world changed? And is this still a relevant topic? And what does it mean for you, for your organizations, and for the Open Group as we go forward? So I'm looking forward to this discussion. Uh, and please participate and join in as we go along. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Um, and Ron, I'll be calling on you every now and again, maybe to help me out with this. Is that OK? Uh, that would be perfectly all right, and I'll look forward to it. OK, thank you. And I have my version, my book of the Boundless Organization here that I've had since about 2001. So it's, it's not the original edition, but it, it's been 
uh, close to me for quite a lot of this period of time. So I'll, I'll try and get through uh, some of these. Ron was going to do some of these slides, but given the audio link and everything else, I'll, I'll give it a go myself. All right. So this is the agenda. How has the idea evolved? What's happened to boundaryless organizations over the 20 years? What's happened to boundaryless information flow? Um, are we there yet, Dad? You know? um, are we there yet? How long is this journey going to go on? Um, do we still need it, as Ron just said, in today's environment? We, we ran a survey in preparation for this uh, about people's attitudes to boundarelessness, uh, how, uh, how adopted it is, uh, whether organizations feel as though they're in a boundaryless organization, um, and their attitudes towards it. And that, there's, there's some fairly interesting results there and some, um, some wonderful, um, we asked an open question about what, what does boundless mean in your organization? And we got some really great answers, 250 of them. It took a while to analyze but, and summarize, but it's amazing. And then the last part is, you know, does that inspire us to do anything and, and what can we do? And um, really, for me, it also leads in to the work that you're doing within the open group. And the, the way that now, um, standards have transformed themselves from really being something that followed industry to something now with uh, what we're talking about today as leading industry. And, and that's an amazing change for this organization and the work that our members are doing. So uh, we're, we're going to go back. Um, only 20 years. I, I think that um, H.G. Wells wrote the book about the time machine in something like 1885 or something like that. So it, it, it's a little bit old, but we were also reminded that um, <clears throat> uh, Back to the Future, the movie, that's 30 years old, um, which is scary. Um, does anyone remember the book Alvin Toffler wrote called Future Shock, which is the, you know, the challenge of things accelerating and how older people are challenged by the acceleration of information, you know? That was written in 1970. That's like 45 years old, right, when he was looking at it now. And, and if you think about the way things are accelerating and continue to accelerate and always will, uh, that, that's quite an amazing thing. So going back then, if we're looking back 20 years, uh, I think at the top left, there's someone jubilant over the fact that the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, passed the 5,000 mark in 1995. It went up about 1,300 points. It, it uh, continued to go up by about 1,000 points the next year and the next year, but 1995, the first time it broke through 5,000. Uh, John Major and Bill Clinton uh, up there. Uh, Mr. Uh, Slobodan Milosevic of the Bosnia, uh, Serbian Bosnian War, uh, that was going on. Uh, anyone recognize the top one? Anyone from the States recognize the top one? Beirut. Oklahoma, Oklahoma City bombing. Um, uh, Premier Rabin assassinated in uh, Israel. The Iran sanctions started, uh, that was 20 years ago. Uh, Grateful Dead, uh, that was their last tour with uh, Jim Garcia, he, he died a, about a month after. And the first Pixar movie, Toy Story, uh, came out. And then if we come into the technology realm, <clears throat> we've got Amazon, eBay, Yahoo, now 20 years old. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that there's, there's quite a few up there that that uh, didn't exist at the time. Um, Google is just a baby compared to these guys. Uh, Java, um, write once, run anywhere was the slogan uh, from the company. Write once, debug everywhere was what other people were saying. I don't know the truth. Uh, Windows 95, Internet Explorer, and uh, how many people have still got a Palm Pilot in a cupboard? <laughs> 
we all had a Palm Pilot. The first piece of mobile technology, wasn't it, really? Mo the Palm Pilot, wasn't it wonderful, that little pen? Uh, DVD, that was, a, that was quite a momentous year for DVDs with um, uh, Sony and Philips uh, in, in one camp uh, doing their product and Toshiba and uh, Time Warner in the other camp. And there was a, a big bit of a war going on, but uh, eventually they, they got together. I think the Toshiba Time Warner one won out, but uh, they got together on, on that. And HTML 2.0. So they were all going on 20 years ago. But closer to home, um, I spent most of 1995 working with the board of, the open, of X Open and OSF uh, and all of our members talking about the merger of X Open and OSF to form the Open Group. And that was a fairly horrendous year in our, in our history. Uh, but at the same time, we, we launched the first um, branding program, the first certification program for products that were entitled to use the Unix brand. Uh, having been given that by Novell, we then used it, uh, so in, instead of being XPG4 um, and, and more alphabet soup because it was XPG4 AIX or HP, HPUX or whatever it was, um, it, that all moved to Unix and uh, 95 was the first time we, we, we used that. So we, we had some, some interesting times there. But uh, we were going through the start of a change. So we, we were at the point where the customer side had tired of the, the issues with portability, uh, with Unix, they really wanted something more. Uh, they wanted to be able to integrate things. They wanted it, they wanted a different style of standard. Really, the the work on uh, developing uh, Unix-related products, such as DCE, was pretty much done. And so people wanted to move on, and and the companies didn't. Um, and so there was this pressure from the customer side to actually reduce. Uh, and merge these organizations so that they wouldn't compete. But at the same time, the, the, the vendor community that were funding these largely um, saw a, an opportunity for si significant cost savings in supporting the two organizations. So, uh, Ron, I've put the, the slide up about uh, with the picture of Jack uh, looking a little older than he did 20 years ago. <clears throat> Would you like to say something to that slide and something about working with Jack as well? We lost him? Where'd he go? Where did you leave him last? Pardon? Ah, oh, Ron. Uh, you're back. So uh, the question I was saying, I've, I've put the, the slide up uh, that shows the picture of uh, Jack Welsh looking a little older than he did 20 years ago. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk to that and what he was about and, and what it was like working with him. Um, yes, well, we, uh, so we could spend the whole morning talking about what it was like to work with Jack, which was uh, <laughs> quite an experience. But uh, Jack, Jack was one of the most intuitive and brilliant business people. And even though his, his behavior was odd at various times and he was sometimes the most wonderful person to work with, and sometimes some, he was the person you wanted to stay away from as far as possible. But he, he had this brilliant sense that GE as a conglomerate, not only across the conglomerate, but across within different businesses, that there was so much leverage that could be created by sharing information, resources, ideas across the different parts of the company. And he felt that that was the sort of the secret to productivity and competitive advantage for GE. But it was locked up by the fact that everybody was in their own silos, their own businesses, and it was a very sort of authoritarian kind of company where the people at the lower levels wouldn't talk to the people at the top unless they went through several barriers and several hurdles. So he wanted to break that down 
and see if we could, uh, if the company could really move faster and be more nimble by sharing much more information. Um, and that, that was his notion of boundaryless. And he started talking about that in the early 1990s. Uh, it took us a while to understand what he actually meant and took his, his people probably a little longer to figure it out. But um, that, that was the essence of, of what, he was, uh, what he was talking about. And he proved to be quite right over the, over the next couple of years. Mm. And GE's productivity and, and ability to get things done just tremendously soared after a while. Thank you. <clears throat> and I, um, I saw Jack present at a, one of these New York World Economic Forum, I think it was. And um, I was desperate to ask him the question because we, we, de we developed the vision of boundaryless information flow. <clears throat> I was desperate to ask him a question. I was getting really annoyed when people kept walking past me with microphones and so on. So eventually I, I, I said, you know, I asked him the question about you know, do you, do you see that in the boundaryless organization there is now more need for information to flow in a boundaryless way so that people have got the information they need when they need it, the right information to the right people at the right time? And um, he wasn't that pleased with the question. <laughs> so, but his answer was absolutely spot on in, in part. Right? The first part was... People always want more information. They've never got enough information. They always want more. Get over it, right? But the other part, which was the, the more intuitive, was boundless is a way of thinking and acting. It's not rigid. It's not information. It, it is, it's a way that you behave in an organization and the way that you act. And... Um, as, as well as the Boundless Organization book, one that I mentioned earlier that Ron was involved with was the GE Workout Program. And that described how they went through these 90-day periods of working out this boundless way of working in the organization. And there it is. So, <clears throat> what we were doing back then was recognizing the need for change in an organization. And historically, organizations, um, large scale was important. It was one of the barriers to entry. Um, and, but what we needed to do was to get, go from that to be uh, agile, to have um, more speed, more, more nimbleness, and sometimes the, the large size of an organization, we inhibited that. The role clarification to flexibility, back in 95, everyone had detailed job descriptions of line by line what you will do and what you won't do. And I don't know how many people have now got job descriptions like that. We moved to sort of, this is where you're going to be effective, the job effectiveness description. So it was more flexible so that people could actually know what they've got to achieve and have got some leeway to achieve it rather than having a line-by-line -line job description. And the other change, and this is really a boundless thing, is moving from having rigid specialization between function departments and so on to being able to integrate cross-functionally. And different organizations would, would have called it different things. So it's not all about GE. There's organizations with tiger teams, cross-functional teams, workout teams, and so on. And all of those were, were, were trying to work across the thing. Um, and trying to move from rigid control to a situation where you could actually innovate and, and bring things through the organization. And that that will work together. So with the flexibility, you can bring innovation. But with control and detailed line by line, it, it stifles that somewhat. And that speed needs to happen. So the, the key thing for Jack Welsh was that <clears throat> boundaryless doesn't mean there are no boundaries, he said. It, boundaries need to be permeable to enable business, not rigid and get in the way of business. And they recognized <clears throat> these four different boundaries or barriers within an organization. 
First of all, there's the top to bottom of the organization and the layers of an organization in the hierarchy. Those barriers of information um, sharing and of enabling people. Um, we went through this empowerment phase, didn't we? Where everyone had to be empowered. And I, that was partly dealing with that. Horizontal, getting people to work cross-functionally. We spent a lot of years, <clears throat> round about 95 uh, onwards, um, before that as well, getting people working cross-functionally. And that was a, a major challenge because um, where I was, like in a finance department, we had a completely different culture to the people in the factory or the warehouse or distribution or lo and behold, you've got these, these weird salespeople, right? Um, people didn't talk to each other outside of their departments that much, right? Um, you've got the barriers with your business partners, customers, suppliers, that you need to have more flexibility there. And the cultural bar barriers um, across uh, for global organizations that really wasn't as flexible as it needed to be. And it's not just language, it's culture and, and everything else. So, um, Ron, I've brought up the slide that's got the permeable picture. Can you talk a little bit about that one? Well, I think the, uh, the notion of permeability is that, uh, as, as Alan just said, it, it doesn't mean no structure, because if there was no structure, you'd have disorganization. But it, it's the, the idea that a, an organization needs to be almost like an organic structure, like cells. The cell walls are permeable, that, um, that uh, electrical impulses, blood flows, um, various kinds of uh, uh, things important to regulate the body are able to move back and forth through the cell walls, but without the cell walls losing their integrity. And that was the same message with, with the boundaryless organization. You need to maintain the integrity of the structure, but be able to move the resources and information around in a way that would uh, leverage the capability of the, of the company. So that, that was the notion of permeability. And it's a, a difficult notion for many people to understand because that boundaryless, many people say, well, boundaryless, we just get rid of boundaries and then we, we talk freely with everyone. But, it's not, but there still need to be certain boundaries. And I think that was part of Jack Welch's answer to Alan's question of people always want more information. They want to get into everybody else's business. They need the right information at the right times. And to do that, you have to have permeability, but it doesn't mean no boundaries at all. Thank you. <clears throat> so here's a, a little exercise um, that we're going to look at. Uh, and, and this is the first time to use the, the voting um, machines. So if you can grab a voting machine. Uh, it's, it's only a little game, a little bit of fun. Um, but really, what, what we'd like you to do is just to press the button that says, how many Fs can you see on that chart? All right? How many Fs can you see on that chart? And then just press the button, and we'll see what the results are. You done? No? Goodness gracious. How many Fs? Don't anyone say there's no F in that chart? Done? Okay, What's, have you all voted? You all pressed your buttons? Can we, can we magic up some results? Wow, okay. The uh, kind of the, the mode, 26% at six. 22% at four. Interesting number. Now, the, the thing is that there are going to be people on your table that have had a different opinion, right? So can you just take a couple of minutes to discuss what you came up with? And we might see if you want to change your vote, okay? 
So just take a few minutes to discuss with the folk. <clears throat> All right, you done? You done discussing? Are we able to take a vote again, second time? Yeah? Yeah, press, press your buttons again, we'll get a different chart, hopefully. Oops, there you go. All right, come on, come on, come on, come on. Vote again. Come on. Press your buttons. What do you got? How are we doing? Do we have a result yet? <clears throat> so... <clears throat> So, Ron, you can't see this, but for your benefit, we started off with uh, the majority of people, 26% roughly at a 6, uh, 22, 24% at a 4. Up at 8 and 9, I think we had about 4% on 8, a few percent on 9. Have we still got that chart? Yeah, so... We had 4% uh, on 7, 8% on 5, 1% on 9, 1% on 10. Uh, so if we go back to the new chart, we've now got 14% on 8, 7% on 9, and 1% on 10. But the biggest numbers, 32% on 6, 31% on 7. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll ask Ron to explain this, but basically <clears throat> it's around perceptions and it's around collaboration. So, Ron, can you just summarize why people saw it differently? Uh, sure, well, I, and I, I'm assuming what you've got, uh, you, everybody there in the, uh, in the audience is uh, sort of some of the best and brightest of your companies. Absolutely. That, uh, you're responsible for all kinds of uh, <clears throat> analytical and technical responsibilities. That's how they get travel when, approval. When, But when, when everyone looks at the same thing, um, we, our, our perception is distorted by a certain, we call it lens theory, that everybody sees the world through a different lens, which is distorted a bit by your education, your culture, your uh, place in an organization, your background, your upbringing, all kinds of things that influence the way you see the world. In, in this particular exercise, many people don't see the the small letter, the letter of, the, the word of that has a, an S at the end because when you read it to yourself, it sounds like a V, and in your mind you're seeing a V instead of an F. Some people miss the one on the top because they're only looking at the body of the text, and many people miss the little tiny one at the bottom, what talked about the, uh, in the copyright portion. There's actually two Fs there. So people don't see it, but the people who see this the best are kindergartners who aren't worrying about the content and um, proofreaders who read it backwards. But everybody else sees different, uh, different numbers of them. The, the point, though, is that when you talk with somebody else, even for 30 seconds or a minute, who may see this, who may see this differently, you see a different number of Fs. And it's the same thing in an organization, is that we see the world through our own lenses, but if you have some dialogue with somebody from a different part of the organization, somebody who sees the world a little bit differently, sees the competitive situation differently, the customer differently, you'll get a richer picture of what reality is and be able to make better decisions. And that's the notion of a more boundaryless organization, is to be able to have that kind of dialogue much more routinely. Otherwise, everybody is stuck with their own blinders. And as I'm sure you've seen many times, people at the top of an organization will, will set a policy or set a price 
or say we, we need to do this and people at the bottom of the organization who are working with customers or working on the front lines will question it and say, you know, why, why would they do that? It doesn't make any sense. Well, it's, people have very different perceptions. So that, that's the, uh, the, the background behind this. So there's, <clears throat> there's actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and two here. So there's nine is the answer. Okay. So what about, um, how many black dots can you see? <laughs> how many can you see? <laughs> That's the question, Ron. How many can we see or how many are there? Do you want to go through it? Well, if everybody stares at, for, at it for a little while, you get hypnotized. So, Alan, this is your opportunity if you just speak in a low voice and very calmly and ask everyone to stare at that, <laughs> then everything you say the rest of the morning will be absorbed by them. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the point of this is that there are actually no little black balls on this chart. It's completely a perceptual illusion. And the idea is that many times in organizations, there are things that we imagine but aren't actually there. We, we attribute motives, for example. And I'm sure all of you who have been in the IT function know that business people will sometimes say, those IT people, what are they doing? They're just trying to take control or they're just trying to force us to do this. But oftentimes they, they make those attributions without actually understanding what it is you're trying to do. And I'm sure at other times, people make attributions of the human resource people or the finance people or the sales people. So that's the other part of boundaryless, is that unless we actually have those dialogues across the boundaries, we attribute motives to other parts of the organization or to our customers or partners that aren't actually true. And those then become almost rigid in how we perceive each other. So that's the point of this little exercise. So if you put them together, there are some things in organizations that we don't see unless we have discussion, and there are some things in organizations that we see but aren't really true. So we have to have the dialogue to be able to get to what, it, what is actually there that we have to act upon. And that, that gets us to what are the key levers for doing that, which is the next chart. Yeah, so the key levers or levers that um, we've got. It's interesting that the, the first one is giving people the right information uh, to enable them to, to do their, their job and their function. But then providing them with the capability. We talk a lot about capabilities now, don't we? But this is back in 95. The capability to use that information and then the authority to do something. So I, I think one of the examples Ron uses is that on the Toyota production line, uh, people have the authority to stop the line if they see something going wrong, rather than everything crashing. And then there's the rewards. Right. And, they've been, and, they've been, and they've been significantly trained to be able to know when they see something, what it means and what to do about it. So it's, it's not enough to just have the information, but they have to have the ability to do something with it and then the authority to actually act upon it without having to ask 10 other people for permission, which is what happened in traditional assembly lines. And then what about the rewards accountability part then, Ron? Well, then you also have to hold people accountable for that, that, that it's not... You give them the authority to act, you have to reward them for doing it well, but also hold them accountable when they do it poorly. So it becomes a, a virtuous cycle of doing it in the right way and taking empowerment, being empowered, but acting appropriately. And, and then the flatter organizations, the delayed structures? So th this, as part of this, this whole being able to become more boundaryless is the the more the more levels of the organization you have it's like uh, i don't know if you remember the child's game of telephone where you whisper something to one person and that person whispers it to the next and whispers to the next and by the time you get through the chain the message is completely distorted well that happens in organizations the more layers and levels there are 
So one, one of the ways of improving information flow is to just structure the organization so that there are fewer layers and fewer opportunities for miscommunication. And then lastly, you have to have the forums for communication. This is what Alan referred to the GE workout, was to create forums where you brought people together from different functions, different parts of the hierarchy, sometimes from your customers, partners, or around the world, and really worked together on a common problem for anywhere from half a day to a couple of days and just got it solved right there and then by getting all the right people in the room together, either physically or virtually. Yeah, and even, even recently I've heard some of our members talking about their organizations and talking about the fact that it takes six months to get down from one layer to the next layer in any initiative that they're working on. <clears throat> so yes, and, and traditionally, traditionally, many organizations sort of do a serial communication of you go to one, you go to one function and you talk to them about solving a problem. You get their ideas, then you go to the next, and then you go to the next, and then you go to the next. And by the time you've gone to six different places, by the time you get it back around to the first, the idea has changed again, and you have to start all over. So the the more you can get everybody at the same time, either physically or virtually to do it together, the more powerful it can be to move more quickly. And I think that was one of the things that we learned at GE, was the, the idea of doing that was, was very important for creating a more boundaryless kind of uh, mindset. So what we were starting to have to deal with was this um, concept of interoperability. A lot of the standards have been around portability, and now people wanted interoperability. And there were many wonderful discussions where we would talk about some new standards that the vendors were talking about, and then the banks would stand up and say, we've got billions of dollars of legacy. We're not just going to throw that out. Right? How do we make it work with what we've got? How do we integrate it? And there was a lot of talk about interoperability. And um, I don't think there's many examples of successful interoperability of large-scale systems. We've done a few. Um, one, one example was with um, the management systems like uh, HP OpenView and CA Unicenter and things like that not talking to each other. And we spent years trying to get them together to have a spec that would make them interoperate. And there was no way you could do it. Where, where we did succeed was with something like LDAP, which was a lightweight thing. But it took a lot of vendors bringing kit together to test against their other and have these plug fests, plug th plug -a thons, whatevers, to actually bring things together. And then to codify that as a spec was difficult. The way we got around the management systems one was actually an open source project called Open Pegasus, where actually code was the solution to act as a, almost an isolation layer, as a translation pipe, things like that. But interoperability has been a tough ask um, to, to do uh, in many ways, um, not just because you can't have a single spec, but not many vendors want their products turned into commodities. And you don't want them all the same. They want to differentiate, and every time they differentiate, it doesn't work. So that was a big challenge for, that was coming along. And it was part of the challenges around what caused the merge of this organization, discussions in 95, 96. Very unhappy customer side members. And around the same time, a bit earlier maybe, in 93-4, uh, um, the customer side members, uh, predominantly in the UK to start with, it was people like the Central Communications Telecommunications Agency, the NHS, Lloyds Bank, I seem to remember, coming together and saying, if we're going to make sense of the integration that we need to do. If we need to make sense of the large scale of organization, we need standards for how to architect them. And um, there was 
bit of pushback, uh, certainly by the vendors at that time that said, well, you can't have standards for our standard architectures. That doesn't make any sense. Um, but also, you know, we were trying to deal with how we, how we please them. And that was part of the challenge to the organization that this was really what uh, they needed. And in fact, the CCTA put up 50,000 pounds to develop a proof of concept. Um, but when we looked at that proof of concept, to actually flesh it out to anything significant was going to cost a lot of money and take a lot of time. So where we went, uh, I'll ask Mike Lambert to comment on that, because Mike, you actually ran these workshops, didn't you? <coughs> yeah, we started, the original demand was for the single definitive open systems architecture. We realized very quickly the companies were different and there was no such thing. So we rapidly came to the conclusion that what we needed was a framework, something that could, uh, was foundational that people could build on. The open group way has always been to try to find a starting point rather than a blank sheet of paper. <clears throat> so what we did, we got a group of people together for a week in Mountain View and at the beginning of the week we built a decision table. So what on earth is an architecture framework? How would we recognize one if we saw it? In particular, what on earth is an open systems architecture framework? We then started to apply that, fr that <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we had a beauty parade. Advocates of different open systems architecture frameworks paraded their wares we got them to strip off so that we could see the insides. We scored them, and at the end of the day, we found this thing called TAFIM from the US Department of Defense. We didn't believe it. We thought something designed for an organization that sets out to kill people cannot possibly be the right thing for the commercial world. However, we redid the decision matrix. If you don't like the result, you redo it came out with the same result. Then we investigated. What were we trying to do? We were trying to find, a, find something that enabled people to make maximum use of standard components, building blocks. What was TAFIM designed to do? It was designed to transform the Department of Defense from a not invented here organization to one which maximized the use of standard building blocks. It was a great fit. We chose TAFIM. We had to do a little bit of work on it. Um, but one of the most important things was that TAFIM brought in the first method. And what we've got now is recognizably similar to what you will see if you go back to the archive of the TAFIM um, document. It's a, it was a really important decision. The US Department of Defense at that said, our job's not doing architecture standards open group, here is TAFIM. They handed over the, the rights to it and we, would, we did everything that we were able to do and it was the basis for the whole of the TOGAF program over 25 years. Thank you. <clears throat> Those of you who have been to our meetings before, you would have seen uh, Dawn Myricks present. Dawn is now Deputy Director of Security at the CIA. Um, she was at that time the CTO at DISA, the Defence Information Systems Agency, and it was through her work that TAFIM was donated to the Open Group. And the first version of TOGAF came out in, they, they donated it in 94, the first version came out in 95, so 20 years ago. And then if we go to 2001, <coughs> By that time, we're up to TOGAF version 7. <clears throat> we managed a, 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 an iteration every year. But it wasn't really until <clears throat> uh, TOGAF 8 came along with the business architecture that it really took off. Uh, version 3, the single Unix specification. And we were starting to measure, or we've been measuring procurements that specified uh, the Unix brand, where, where this information is public. 
And that was over 25 billion. At that point, it got up to 56 billion before we stopped counting. Um, so the next, um, <clears throat> the next event, trying to deal with this interoperability question, we, we were really sort of challenged as to what on earth our members could do and how we could influence them to do things. And um, Paddy Donovan, our, v, our C, C chief marketing officer, pulled together a group of people in the transportation industry that was uh, Boeing, Airbus, and others. They told us to say that. <laughs> um, and we, we had a meeting in Chicago to understand what interoperability was. Now, one of the um, standards within the standard this TOGAF is called business scenarios. And uh, I'll get the author of that to, to talk to us a little bit in a minute. But um, we used the business scenario method quite effectively as a, as a basis. Uh, a lot of homework was done to actually draw out the discussion. And we wanted to understand what they meant by interoperability. And we, we got halfway through the morning, I think, and they, they pulled us up and said, uh, interoperability is just a technical term. Our problem is access to in integrated information. It, the information is important, not the interoperability. And um, in fact, Boeing donated this slide that many of you may have seen before, which explains their situation. It explains boundless as well. So Boeing, like many other organizations, have been going through their own version of the boundless organization. And once upon a time, they would go from bottom left to top right. They would go through buying parts designing and manufacturing an airplane, and then thinking about selling it. And it was very much an end-to-end -end process, process. And so the, the legal folk got, got involved with selling a little, um, but not too much. And everyone was in their own silo, in their own stovepipe. And what they'd been doing over the years, in order to compete with Airbus and others, was to try and get people working cross-functionally so they could speed up the production of the airplanes. And so they had to have legal working along selling. They had to have uh, sales feeding back into requirements, into procurement, and so on. They had to get these people working cross-functionally. They built these tiger teams, and so on. But that, that, what they explained to us on this day uh, back then, in 2001, was We've got people working together, but they're not being effective because although we're getting them out of those silos, all of the applications that they have were built for those silos without any concept that they'd ever need to talk to other applications. And I guess most of us older ones can remember putting those applications in uh, and not thinking, Good God, they've got, to, they've got to pass information to other parts of the organization. It never, never crossed our minds back then. And the, the problem in Boeing's case was exacerbated because not only were all those applications conceived differently, we, we just worried about what the input was, the process, and the output. But they also had to integrate with their business partners. And even then, back then in 2001, I asked Boeing, how many applications are you running and how many business partners have you integrated your infrastructure with? And they went away for a couple of days and they came back and they said, we don't actually know how many applications we're running, but we can tell you that we've integrated our infrastructure with more than a thousand business partners. And I, I, I did the same sort of question at... Um, uh, at GE, and I asked the C CIO there, and, and she was concerned that at any one time there was something like 500,000 people inside their infrastructure that weren't their employees. 
And she wasn't sure if they were just making off with her infrastructure. So that, was, that really captured the problem for us. And we moved on from there through the members. And, and Terry led. Do you want to talk about how we went from, or talk a little bit about that, and then how we went through to well, the next I, stages? I, I, let me start with, um, as Mike said, we had TOGAF. It started with a collaborative uh, group and a lot of uh, contributions from a lot of people that gave us an architecture development method. In, uh, I think, TOGAF 8, we brought in the business scenario method, um, which was my contribution to uh, TOGAF. And I think some brilliant minds said, back on, back on. Uh, hey, why don't we use our own architecture development method within our problem space? And that is why we had this business scenario uh, meeting that Alan referred to. And we followed that up with a, nu uh, a number of other uh, sessions with uh, members of the open group customer side primarily. <clears throat> what that ended up doing was, number one, bringing different views of the problem um, and gave us a bigger picture of the problem. And it also led to <clears throat> the realization that it wasn't really about interoperability. Interoperability may help sell solve a problem, but it's not the problem. The problem was getting access to the right information at the right time and getting it to support, no kidding, business problems and to actually achieve, no kidding, business outcomes. Uh, so it was a, a, a great process of taking, well, the, the exercise where you're looking and finding black dots, the whole process of getting people in the room and having them talk together as opposed to assuming the views of other uh, folk, whether they're management folk or technical folk, was was very key. So that's about it. Thank you. And this was done in the year that Wikipedia was launched for the first time. More boundaryless information. Or useless information, whichever way you put it. Um, so that's, that's the vision that we had, which is boundaryless information flow. and. Um, the, 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 we, we got from the need for access to integrated information or an integrated information infrastructure, which is what the customer side said. And then the, the vendor said, well, actually, that's our job. And, and they were struggling over it. And I was enamored with the boundaryless organization at the time. So that's how we got to boundaryless information flow. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that security was in there. Um, it didn't mean there was no security. And it also meant reliable and timely. So the right information gets to the right people on a need to know or authorized um, in a reliable and timely manner. And that comes out in the survey later. So the, the next question is, you know, to what extent is the job done? Do we need, need to focus on it and, and, and where are we going? So on, on this um, slide, we've got a number of things. And, and Ron, feel free to jump in. So the, the first one, the global economy, is around organizations that once upon a time, if you were a global organization, you would send people from your home base to a different country to work as expats and so on. And now it's much more um, of being present in, in that country. Matrices, uh, we've always had matrix, matrix structures. The healthcare was an, uh, was an old example where uh, people had to report both to the, uh, the, um, the, the health professionals as well as to the people running the organization. But now, uh, I've, I've spoken to people in some companies like IBM where individuals would have 12 different people to report to in their matrix. So, you know, it's a much more complex world. One of the 
Um, great examples I, I saw many years ago, and, and it's not a current example, Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel and the Moore's Law, he was asked one day by a, a new person about, you know, can I see the organization chart? And he said, I, uh, well, we don't have an organization chart in Intel. He walked over to a whiteboard, he put a cross on the board, and then he put a cross around it. And he said, that's you. They're the people that you need to work with, and that's all you need to know. Right? That's our organization chart. You'll see up there, you'll probably recognize uh, what we call open platform 3.0, which is the convergence of social, mobile, cloud, big data, internet of things. So the internet of everything, uh, internet of things and big data is, is up there as people are capturing every piece of information. The mobile, the bring your own device, we've got all of those going on. The social media, as people access things and, and cloud computing. And, and when we talk about the ability to scale up in cloud and all of those have got a, a relevance. The millennials are much quoted at the moment, um, but that, it's, a, it's a generation thing. But they're a, they're a product of what we've created over the years. So you can talk about millennials having a different expectations, but it's because of the, the climate and the culture that we produce and then the sustainability part, and the need for startup, not only of new organizations, but within existing organizations. So this is where organization, whole industries are changing. And some of the traditional barriers to entry are going. So yeah, back 20 years ago, uh, Amazon and eBay came along. We get our news and information differently. Um, Facebook and Twitter. Uh, 20 years ago, we probably believed everything the BBC told us, didn't we? Um, CNN, that's really only for hotel rooms when I'm abroad, right? I can only take that in small doses. On the transportation side, uh, Uber, Uber, they came along in 2012. So they've only been around three years. It's quite amazing. Lyft is a peer-to-peer um, -peer, uh, car sharing taxi type service. Um, Kayak is a search engine um, that searches uh, hotel and um, a flight like Expedia and Trivago and all of those kind of things. And Tesla cars, of course. Tesla, their first car came out in 2008, so that's not too long. On the health set, healthcare side, none of those are particularly young, but through acquisition and growth and so on, they've come through. And on the, on the music and entertainment, we, we just changed the way people view things. Um, in, in the US, in the past, um, Nielsen would measure how many people watched a program through the overnight ratings. Um, and that's just not possible anymore because people don't watch things like that, they watch it when they want to, time shift, download from Netflix, music through uh, Pandora or Spotify, uh, using Apple TV. All of those things have, have kind of changed over the years. You know, it's, it's quite amazing that YouTube came along in 2005, so that's not that old. The way things are changing, I, you know, no one's safe, safe at all. We know what happened when Amazon came along. Now with Tesla, they're, they're completely turning the motor vehicle industry upside down. I, I'd be very surprised if they got accused of falsifying their emissions. Could happen? Uh, no. Um, Amazon have suddenly become an IT vendor. Of, of some note, uh, certainly, um, certainly of some uh, volume now in uh, areas like the Department of Defense as well. And um, you've got a, an app developer, you know, a very young one, controlling more taxes and, and disrupting that industry significantly. 
And the customer journey, uh, you know, something we worry about, the customer journey, because it's, all, it's always been there, and always you, you start with someone being aware of your product or service, finding something out about it, deciding to buy it, use it, pay for it, and, and the, the end product that you want is that they'll recommend it. So many years ago I learned that the purpose of advertising for BMW was not to sell BMW cars to new BMW owners. It was to reinforce to existing owners what a great car they had so that they would be more likely to recommend them to their friends. And I know very few BMW owners that haven't that bought a, a BMW that wasn't influenced by someone else saying how great it was. And that's, that goes for a lot of, lot of things like that. But now, um, it's, it's much more sophisticated than that. And we have to be aware of all of the things on Facebook, TripAdvisor, TopTable. Um, so, you know, you become aware of it through maybe Facebook, or you become aware of it uh, through, through the web. Or you might look at TripAdvisor to see if it's got a good rating and how many people have rated it. We do that all the time now. So, in this case, a, a restaurant, they've got to be very conscious of what those ratings are and make sure that it fits with their image. It's no good everyone trying to be the same kind of restaurant. One of, one of the analogies that I like a lot, especially if you're trying to change an organization, it depends on who you've got in your organization, right? So if, you, if you've got a, a, a restaurant and you want to get more customers and you want to change the ambience, you want to change the menu, it's not going to work if your normal customers are Hell's Angels. Right. It just, it, it's not going to change a lot. There's the textings, SMS, um, you'd order it through top table, book, the, book it through top table, pay it through PayPal, and then rate it afterwards. This is actually part, the, part of some work we're doing with TM Forum, um, but also it's part of the uh, new work group within the Open Platform 3.0 Forum, which is the digital business strategy and customer experience. So if you take a look at what they're doing, they've got a lot of these examples of testing out what those customer experiences are. And we've got the disruption curves. So you can see in the blue the things that we're talking about, obviously enabled by the internet to start with, but then you've got social, mobile, cloud, big data, internet of things, coming down into the innovation accelerators, the green parts, through the 3D printing, renewable energy, internet of things, and so on and then coming up to some potential um, disruptive scenarios. So here's a poll. Martin, did you want to take over from there? I need to do that, do I? Oh, this, it just works. I'm amazed. Wonderful. Okay, so back to the voting machines. Not a trick this time, this is just a survey. <clears throat> okay, given the changes of the past 20 years, particularly the ability to communicate and move information across the world so much more effectively, to what extent do you think people want to be able to collaborate even more effectively across organisational boundaries? So more effectively. Do they want to? Do you think they have a strong desire They'd be okay if it happens, or they're really not that interested. One, two, or three, real simple. Oh, we got time, I love that. Wow. Okay, finish voting. What's the result? How about that? So you can't see this wrong, but 72% have got a strong desire. Uh, to be able to collaborate more effectively. 25% would be okay if it happens, and 4% uh, 
we think that 4% of the world would, wouldn't care that much. Cool. What's the next one? Okay, to what extent do you think our organizations are already boundaryless? boundaryless? Uh, so one, we're already there, two, we're partly there, and three, we've got a long way to go. Okay, finish voting. What's the result? <laughs> so, 4% are already there, <clears throat> a third are partly there, and two thirds have got a long way to go. Cool. Next. Okay, to what extent do you think becoming more boundless is a cultural social issue or a technology issue? Is it mostly cultural social? Is it a mix of both? Or is it mostly technological? It's a big word for a Tuesday morning. Okay, what's the result? It's a mix of both. Okay, the techies, you're off the hook. It's not your fault. <laughs> okay, 45% is uh, mostly cultural social, social and 55% uh, is a mix of cultural social and technological. Okay. Uh, to what extent do you think information flow enables the kind of collaboration across boundaries that people want? Definitely enables, it can help, or it doesn't make much difference. There you go, 53% it definitely helps, 43% it can help, and 4% it doesn't make much difference. That's a relief. Oh. <laughs> it could have been worse, couldn't it? All right, how are we doing? Is that it? Okay. So, Ron, I've come to the, um, <clears throat> the one that says our view, despite all the progress, learning how to be boundless is even more critical today. Do you want to cover that one? Uh, sure, but let me just make a, a, a first comment on the, on the polling. Which is fascinating results, which is a very strong desire, or people say that there's a strong desire to have more collaboration across boundaries, but also feeling very strongly that we have a long way to go. We're not there yet. So, uh, and I think that that matches what what we've been seeing. You know, over 20 years, lots of progress with with new technology, but the social structures and the way organizations are actually run hasn't caught up yet. And I think um, that that's sort of the purpose of this next couple of slides. Is our our view is that despite all the technical progress, I mean, we we have tools now that we just even couldn't dream about 20 years ago. I mean, not only the the rise of the the internet and texting and social media and and smartphones and mobility and the cloud and everything else, but just um, we, we still we still need organizations that are more boundaryless. We still need speed and scale. And this is one of the things I think we've learned over the twenty years is that it's not going from scale to speed, but we need both. You need organizations that do have critical mass and resources, but can operate with the nimbleness of a small company. And we're seeing the companies that are probably most effective are you know larger companies like uh, like. Google and Amazon, they have become big companies with scale, but they still operate with nimbleness and speed. And the possibility of integrating their different specialties has been, has been very powerful. And having real innovation while not getting out of control. Um, I, I think the uh, recent example in the auto industry with, uh, with the, the emissions controls was a 
you know, this is not 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 the right kind of control, but innovation happening probably at levels where it shouldn't happen without control. And I think the idea is that you need both innovation and control, and then uh, to have the the flexibility with role clarity to be able for people to move around the organization and be able to do what's needed, and have more of the sort of mentality of a startup of let's just jump in and and let's uh, get things done. So I, I think this is the these are some of the still social and cultural issues in organizations that still need to be addressed. Which brings us to the, I don't know if I'll have to put up the next slide on uh, well, we thought, the, the, the other. Before, before we go to the next slide, I've just got a little, that, that um, radio clip to play, and then we'll go through. So the radio, uh, yes. the radio clip, this was from um, the BBC Radio 2 News last Wednesday and they're talking about the police service and some mistakes that they made and the root causes of those mistakes. The Chief Constable of West Mercia Police, David Shaw, has admitted that his force seriously let down the family of a teenager who was murdered in Shropshire two years ago. A serious case review into the death of Georgia Williams has highlighted a series of mistakes made by different agencies who had contact with her killer, Jamie Reynolds. The Vice President of the Police Superintendents Association, Chief Superintendent Gavin Thomas, says the case highlights a recurring problem. There were clearly mistakes made by West Mercia and agencies but in my view there's a common trait um, within serious case reviews and that common trait is the inability of various agencies to exchange information in a timely and efficient manner getting the information the right information to the right professional at the right time and I didn't pay him to say that <laughs> so yeah going to the next slide then Ron um well, I think the, the point of this slide is that all of this that we're talking about in, in terms of create, uh, creating a more boundaryless organization and mindset and ways of working mm. is not just within an organization, but it's uh, on a more global scale, if you sort of take it up a level. It's how, how do we connect the systems and information flows, not just within a company, but across companies. Uh, and if, you, if you go back 100 years ago, the Ford Motor Company was a vertically integrated from having their own, their own mines and having their own manufacturing and having their own sales and assembly, and et cetera. So they didn't need any other partners. Now there's no such thing as a, a vertically integrated company across an industry. We have ecosystems of companies that, that provide services to customers. So you need to connect all the systems across companies. The same thing with geographies. It's, it's not just geographies within a company, but it's geographies with partners because we almost all outsource things to partners in different parts of the world who can do things most effectively with the least amount of expense and the greatest amount of skill. Um, and as, as Alan talked about before, the, the boundaries of industries are changing, and that's because there's this notion of companies have different capabilities, and if you can find solutions to customer problems by combining those capabilities. And then there are, there are global problems like terror, security, the environment, sustainability, that require companies teaming up and whole industries teaming up and governments teaming up and, and other governmental and non-governmental institutions all collaborating to be able to address these issues and doing all that while maintaining some amount of global stability while still having all the disruptive innovation going on. So this means information flows and boundaryless thinking on a global scale that has never occurred before. So I think the, the social and technological needs of boundarylessness, at least in our view, are going to be even greater over the next couple of decades than they ever have been before. <clears throat> so, um, looking at it from an open group point of view, we know about um, the nexus of forces, we know about the open platform, we know that uh, internal customers are 
using their own devices, they're bringing their own devices, managers are buying cloud services, there's so much more pressure on uh, getting the outside coming into um, the organization. Um, using the big data, everything increasingly connected, all of these things are accelerating. But um, I was reminded by Andy Mulholland of Melvin Conway and his law, which, which says that basically you are constrained by your uh, organization design, you're constrained by your ecosystem, you're constrained by that, and all of your thinking, uh, however smart you are, is constrained by the way in which you communicate and how you, you communicate within your organization and with your ecosystem. So where, where we're going with standards, and this is, this is the great thing for me because I can see that we're now moving ahead of where the technology is going. And there's a couple of uh, things. So we've, we've got this back, backbone now pretty firmly entrenched of enterprise architecture that's very well adopted. And there's a lot of work going on in the security forum and, uh, around risk and vulnerability management, real-time real embedded systems looking at high assurance. But in reality, there's, there's two big things going on right now. One is from the inside out going to outside in and making that move of organizations. And the other is going from IT managing the business to managing the business of IT. And we'll talk about that a little later. So here we've got Open Platform 3.0 and IT for IT. And on the security side, we've got our Open Risk Taxonomy and Open Fair. So the inside out um, approach. So originally, what we were looking at is where you know, work is assigned um, to people and it's done in a consist consistent manner. Sources, they know where they're getting their information. The recipients of the information are closed. And most of the communication is email or phone or whatever. And we're going to a situation where everyone has to res respond to real-time events and get information from multiple sources. And it's been done in a different way through email, social, mobile, and everything else. Right? I wanted to use a, a comparison here. So this I took from um, a journal, a respected journal, back in 1995, talking about the current practice of gate assignments and the fact that every night at 6 p.m. the airlines would file their, gate as their, their arrival times and they would be assigned gates. And that wasn't working. So in 1995, they decided that they were going to build a model. And that model was going to have these parameters by arrival schedule and so on. So they, they built this wonderful model and you can see that there, you know, at the top they're looking at the gate, characteristic, gate characteristics, they're looking at the arrival departure characteristics and then the gate assignments, arrival type, um, and they, they had to assign a gate depending on um, how many passengers there were, how full the plane was, how big it was, what the elapsed time to clean it was and service it was and all those things. And it still didn't work. Um, if you get to uh, 2010, you, you get this kind of scenario that says, imagine a scenario where as the aircraft makes its final approach for landing, the gate has been allocated, is no longer available. Right? We've all been there. Uh, we've sat on runways or we've sat waiting for delayed planes. A new gate is assigned. And the problem, of course, is that the people that were going to wave the flight in, the people that were going to clean the plane, they're all in the wrong gate. Right? So even if you get to the gate, get the plane to the gate, it, it doesn't work. Everyone's in the wrong places. A lot of the communication is done by voice, by telephone, um, uh, and paper. And, and the, the result is you know, people getting to the wrong gate, getting there late, uh, late departure and extra ground. And the, the planes had to, the airlines had to build in quite a big buffer time to allow for all of this. And that meant that they couldn't utilize their planes as effectively as they could if they could turn them around more quickly. Well, today that's much more possible. And we don't experience many of the same delays, well, apart from Ryanair and EasyJet, but 
we don't experience many of the same delays as we did. We, we very often know from flight tracker more, you know, ahead of some of the, the staff at the airline, when the plane's going to arrive, what gate it's going to be at. And we're getting the right information at the right time on any device we want. And the airport operation staff are getting that same information on any device. And it's adapting to that that is what's making a huge difference. And the result, of course, is happy people. Yeah? But as well as that, you've got these faster turnaround times. It's more efficient. The planes can be utilized better. You don't need that buffer time. You don't have the problems with the passengers. You don't have those delays and departures. So huge strides coming through this last 20 years in the way these things are done. And a lot of that is coming together with, with this convergence around what we call Open Platform 3.0. And this is based on these uh, building blocks and these architectural patterns. And as I said earlier, you know, you, we, we've got a new snapshot of Open Platform 3.0 out this week. The work group around the digital business, digital business, digital business strategy and customer experience. That's it. Digital, digital business strategy and customer experience work group, uh, producing a lot of information there. And then IT to manage the business, moving from that to managing the business of IT. I'm not going to talk a lot about that because we're going to be talking about that after the coffee break. But here, again, we're talking about reducing redundancy, boundaries, latency, moving towards value chains and reference architectures. I want to whip through the results uh, of the survey. We, we had 250 respondents to the survey. Um, 184 of those were vendors, and uh, 190 of them had more than 5,000 employees. Now, th these were the, um, the, this was an analysis that I did of the verbal response. We got 250 sort of open question responses, and that took a while. So you can see that the largest part of the screen is devoted to the people that have a positive, their organization believes that boundless information flow is a positive thing. 20% think of uh, a kind of um, uncertain um, and 15% are negative. And out of that, if you look at the negative, 40% of the negative responses are just saying there's too many silos in this organization. 30% uh, are saying boundless information flow is just an impossible dream. And there's a few quotes to follow that up. Of the um, neutral people, 70% were just um, no comment. Uh, others were, it's important but not happening, which is what we saw here. And uh, it's an unknown concept in our organization. On the positive uh, people, the, those that said boundaries information flow is positive in their organization, they balanced it with saying, yeah, but it's making sure that we've got access to the information that the right people have got access to the right information at the right time, that it is on a need to know or somehow secure, depending on level or role or whatever, and that the information has some business value. So you have to have the access to the information at the right time and it's got to have some business, it's got to have some value that you can do something with. Uh, over two thirds thought it was positive. I think we've covered that. Here's some lovely quotes um, at the top right. It's at the core of our project success. When we apply the open group principles, models, practice, we get the right information at the right time. There was a lot of quotes about the right information at the right time, just like the policeman. Uh, it means business agility and data driven, the ability to collaborate. It's when information flows seamlessly. We have a secure environment where all staff can see all information subject to levels of confidentiality, need to know. There were some, uh, some other ones that I, I, I liked. Um, top right, it's like a data unicorn. Right? Some people believe it exists, but no one can point at it and tell you they've seen it. Right? That's, that's kind of fun. Or uh, what does your organization think about boundaryless information flow? They think it's cloud computing. Or the other one, uh, this is kind of interesting. If you're talking about global organizations, and people that are doing Agile or DevOps, there are some people of the opinion that 
if you're bringing in Agile or DevOps and you can't be there, you're excluded from the process and therefore you don't have access to knowing how the thing's developing. So you don't get the information. A few other uh, parts. Uh, only a quarter think they get the right information at the right time. About 40% think their colleagues see different information at different times, depending on different level, function and business. Uh, slightly better, 33% of participants think their colleagues in other locations see different information. And only 16% of participants believe customers, suppliers and business partners have access to the same information at the same time. All good fun. Uh, this one's kind of fun. Um, you've got uh, the top one and the third one. Managers get real-time information wherever they are or get real-time information after defined reporting periods wherever, wherever they are. So the blue and the white kind of go together uh, and the other two uh, depend on certain being in the right place. This one splits up 50%, so IT controls and manages everything uh, on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side IT provides the environment and helps the organization and, and consults. We, we're going to have a few table questions. Uh, I think I'm running a bit low on time, but we'll, we'll come back to those if we need to. Have we got questions? Okay. We'll come back to those. But bear, bear in mind those, those kind of questions while we're thinking about this. The, the kind of wrap-up here is that over the past 20 years, the pace of change has continued to accelerate, and it always will. That's just the nature of information and education. Uh, the need to think and act in a boundaryless way is critical, uh, with necessary attention to security, timeliness, relevance, and information value. The need to focus on the outside in is even more critical as companies function in a more globally and locally interconnected ecosystem. And the need to integrate IT and technology changes with the social structure of organizations. And that's even more cr critical as we create cultures that can embrace that more rapid change. So in this context, um, standards are now leading a lot of things rather than just trailing. Um, you all, as members, have this opportunity to influence the changes that are going to happen over the next decade and lead things. And that's the mission of the Open Group, Boundless Information Flow. And hopefully you'll find this quite exciting as we go forward. So, Steve, you're going to do the questions? Yeah. Um, please give a big round of applause for that, that presentation. We Fantastic job against uh, some difficulties, um, challenges. Um, one thing before we start the questions, those of you who haven't been following the conference Twitter feed, um, hashtag OGEDI has been the number nine trending hashtag in the UK for the past two hours. So well done for everyone who's tweeting. Good job. Yeah, yeah, well done, well done. So, Ron, do we, do we have you? Do we still have you? Uh, yes, yes, I'm still here. Excellent. Okay, Ron. Well, if I could start with a, with a question for you. Um, last month you had a, an article published in the Harvard Business Review that was called um, something along the lines of, forgive me if I get it, don't get it exactly right, but something along the lines of Jack Welch's approach to breaking up silos still works. Can you say a little bit more about uh, the, what that was about and, and the basis for that, that follow-up article? Well, I, th I think the main point is similar to what we've been talking about here. Is, uh, I mean, 20 years ago when, when Welch was talking about uh, breaking down silos, we, we, we didn't have the tools we have now to be able to share information. So if, if we wanted to get somebody from a different function, we had to call them on the phone or send over a fax, which was you know the, the brilliant new technology we had at the time, et cetera. And that, now we, we have the, the opportunity to have this instantaneous information flow 
between different different functions, but it's still not working. And I think this has been confirmed by some of the uh, the polling questions we just did. Is many of you saying that it's uh, that we're, we're not there yet? We haven't created this boundaryless organization. So we still have to work hard on the culture of organizations to be able to allow that and, and facilitate it. The, the problem is that some, some of the technology has created so much intensity and time use that even though we have the intention of sharing information, we almost don't have the time to have the dialogue and discussion. So I don't know how many of you in the audience feel, but many of the people I work with, it's we're sort of on on call 24-7 now. We never get a break. And then to think that in addition to that, we have to intentionally get other people together to have discussions of things is just really hard. So I, I think that's the, the, the challenge I was trying to talk about in that article is that even though we have all the tools, the, uh, in, so, in some ways the tools have made it more difficult because they've overwhelmed us with the, with the time it takes to keep up with everything. Okay, thank you. So I, I hope that answers your question, Steve. Okay, yes it does, Ron, thank you, thank you. So um, we've got a number of questions have come in from the, from the audience here, so uh, not, not specifically addressed to, uh, it, to either of you, but first one, um, some, think that, some think that people, process and technology are needed to implement change to realize the boundaryless organization. What is the most important role for people, for processes, and for technology? thought that might be a tough one. Yeah. <clears throat> What's the most important role? It, it, it's all of the above. Yeah. Um, I, I think, as Jack Welch said, that it, it comes down to the people primarily, and it's about the approach, and it's about the attitude of mind, and uh, enabling others to have information that's going to empower them, enable them to do their job, giving them the capability to do something with it, and so on, it is probably the number one thing. Um, technology, obviously, is the tools. You've got to have the right tools to do the job, to do any job. And, you know, process, you know, I'm, I'm a big process person, so that, you know, that's, that's always, always important. uppermost in my mind. Any, any comment on that, Ron? Well, if I can just add, one of the things I see often is that, and maybe it's because of the lack of time that anybody has, is that if, if, if most people would just step back for a moment and even just on, on their whiteboard or with a colleague do a quick process map of what, what is the information flow that they're working on, where are they, where are other people, and uh, just, just have a basic understanding of it. Oftentimes we make all kinds of assumptions that other people are getting the information, what they're doing with it, when they're getting it, why they're getting it, et cetera, uh, with, without just taking the, and it only takes a few minutes to, to reflect on what is, the, what is the process map of information flow and what can we do to make it better. And that, that's a combination of it. We, I think we have the tools to make it better, but we often don't reflect on wh where are the leverage points to do that. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, wonderful to see the evolution of boundaryless information flow. Um, over the years, the concept of information has changed in a sense that information today has much more soft values included. For example, people organize around information, as can be seen in Wikipedia, Twitter, things like that. I'd like to hear your vision on this way, uh, on this very fundamental change to our concept of information in relation to the boundaryless information flow of it. People organizing around information and the, uh, the soft values of information. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know about the soft values. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's, there's good and bad there, isn't there? There's, there's people organizing around information for bad purposes. But it doesn't mean to say they're not getting <laughs> the information flow, right? right. right. So it, it's more a case of, you know, in an organization, we're, we're thinking primarily about for organizations functioning rather than going out and choosing a restaurant, really. Um, 
for the restaurant, it's important that you've got your, your monitoring TripAdvisor and Twitter and things like that. Um, you know, United Airlines, very responsive. If I, if I phone them up and ask for something, I get very short. Uh, they, they don't want to know. If you put something out on Twitter, they're, they're, they're there in two hours, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's the way they've organized their, 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 their business to actually respond to that social media thing. And I, I think that's, that's an important aspect. But for any, anyone in an organization, really, if you think of the Golden Moore organization chart, which is you're there and there's people around you, the question is, am I getting the information I need to do what I'm expected to do? And am, have I got the capability to do what I'm expected to do? And am I passing the information to people I should be passing it to who are authorized to get it to enable them to do things? Okay. Ron? Well, I, th I think this gets us into partly the, the whole notion of data analytics and big data. We, we have tools to analyze data in different ways now that we didn't have even a few years ago to look at what are the trends and patterns and how to better organize around those trends and patterns and, and respond to them. Um, one, one of the challenges of big data is that we tend to do an analysis of almost you know, huge amounts of data, but it may not be the right data. So I think with that uh, sort of outside-in thinking, if we, if, we, if we have the right data to, to look at, so I was working with one company that was, for example, lo looking at the uh, commuting patterns using cell phone data that was being uh, tracked to see how, how, what are the ways that people are moving through cities using cell phone data to look at the uh, commuting patterns. And that was uh, being very useful to the cities in terms of being able to shift the way that they manage the, their, the streets and the uh, rail lines and the, the bus lines, et cetera. So I, I think we, we have an ability to organize around data and respond to data in ways that we didn't have before. We have to make sure it's the right data and be creative about that. But I think that's a whole new frontier that uh, is gonna be very powerful in the coming years. Okay, thank you. So we've heard that social and cultural issues are, are key to achieving boundaryless information flow. Um, have you seen any examples out there, specific cases about how these kinds of issues have been addressed with some success? Maybe one for you, Ron. Uh. Well, I, I mean, I think we see a lot. The, the example I just gave is is one of somewhat success. I mean, being able to look at commuting patterns um, requires collaboration between cell phone providers, city planners, uh, city transit people, et cetera, and, and having sort of biased third, uh, unbiased third-party facilitators who are managing that data and looking at the patterns and being able to, to do that. I, I think that's the beginnings of that kind of trends. The, the example that Alan talked about with airports is another opportunity for that. Now, s some of these are happening um, in sort of disruptive, disruptive ways. Uh, Uber, Uber's sort of takeover of the, of the taxi industry and transportation industry is really a data flow issue of they're able to kind of manage data flow between the providers and the, and the people who are looking for service. Um, and, it, you know, it's not, not always perfect as we, you know, see that, that that doesn't always work, but it's working far better than anything before. So we're, we're starting to see real examples of where boundaryless information flow is having profound impact on the customer experience and the ability of companies to be able to provide or ecosystems being able to provide the right information in the right, the right time in the right place. Uh, we're still a long way to go, I think, as your survey and the polling that you just did uh, talks about, but, but the promise is there, and that, that's quite exciting. Alan, maybe you have some other kind of positive examples. <clears throat> well, uh, almost every one of our conferences is someone talking about how they're using that information. Um, and, and very often it's couched in uh, an architecture type discussion, a TOGAF type discussion. But talking about, you know, you've got um, 
councils talking about how they're gathering data around um, their, um, what they're doing for their local citizens right. and how they're doing that and providing information out to that. Um, you've got whole governments like the Korean government um, providing e-government services because they're able to provide the right information to the people that need it when they need it. And then you've got um, car manufacturers who are gathering data on every, everything that moves in their vehicle uh, and using big data to actually find ways of improving their vehicles. You've got um, railroad organizations um, being able to do predictive maintenance because they've, they've got better information coming in. That it, 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 it's everywhere, right? Um, another yes, and I, I mean, I see it on a more micro level, too, even within organizations like in, in hospitals and hospital systems, see much more rapid translation and transfer of information about clinical best practices, you know, what, what drugs work with what conditions, what treatments for which kinds of illnesses that, that used to be, you know, every doctor would have their own sort of way of doing things, and now we're seeing much more use of of uh, boundaryless flows of those information so that uh, patient care in, in some hospital systems is really being quite positively impacted by being able to quickly learn from what others have done, not just in that hospital system, but across the world. And, and that's very, very powerful kinds of opportunities there. Well, you've also got people diagnosing themselves um, based on what they've seen online as well and <coughs> coming to the conclusion that they have everything under the sun. Um, wrong with them, but, uh, but yeah, in the right hands, it's, it's good stuff. And, and you've got all the Fitbits. Yeah, the Fitbits, all the, uh, all the wear, yeah. So um, another question from the audience. Tools are not the issue, with a very big exclamation mark after it. Um, the questions that need to be asked are, what information do I need to do my job? What information do we need to drive the business forward? And what information will help me to make a decision? Yep. The problem is, people and organizations don't know how to articulate those questions. Any guidance on getting those questions articulated? Well, I know how I do it. It's like, give me the blame, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, it, it is a case of communicating with whoever will listen. You know, if, if, if you're not getting the information and you believe that that's what you need to do your job, you need to give people the information that you're not getting the information. Right. You need to tell people, right? It's a two-way street. It's a bit like what you said about the org chart, the yeah, intel or lack but, of, but, yeah. Um, Okay. Yes. to get it. Yeah, in the case of that police clip, um, everyone had a lot of information that they weren't sharing, and other people didn't know that they had the information, so they didn't know to ask for it. So the, the fact that there was no way of pooling that information meant that the, the people that could have used it didn't know it existed and couldn't get it, right? And therefore, that it was no good to them. Um, Alan, you mentioned, I, sorry, Ron, something to add? Well, if I can add, I, I mean, I think this is a leadership issue as, as, as much as a technology or more than a technology issue. If, if you think of MBAs and people who are trained for leadership positions in, in companies, they're not usually trained in information flow thinking. So the, this is a case where the, 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 business has become an IT, every company has become basically an IT company in terms of managing information flows and making sure that the information is the right place at the right time for the right decision structures. 
most managers have not been trained in that, and it's it's not taught in in business schools. So it's much more sort of intuitive and people making it up as they go along. But uh, I think the best managers are, are asking those kinds of questions, which is who needs the information, when do they need it, how do we get it to them, and how do we empower them to be able to do something with that information. Um, right. Yeah, and, and the problem... So I, I, it's, it's a great, great question. Yeah, and, and, and the problem very often like that example is that there are such deep silos within the organization. Um, another question. Do you, do you think the huge sunk cost of legacy systems is as much of an issue now or a barrier now as it, as it was 20 years ago? Whew, that's one for the audience, I think. Um, <laughs> we might hear some more about that later. But, um, you know... <coughs> 90% of your budget is spent on maintaining the legacy, isn't it? Um, something like that. Um, the ability to turn on a dime doesn't exist. Um, and, and you've got this latency and dependability and so on. And so uh, one of the things we hope that we're going to see with IT for IT is a way of um, making, making some of that less painful. But yeah, you still got that legacy or heritage, um, whichever way you look at it, that um, you have to deal with. And organizations are prisoners of both their legacy, but also their culture and their communications yeah. Yeah. Uh, systems. Okay, we're getting close to our, uh, running out of time, but um, uh, last question, I would imagine. Uh, one dear to my heart, legal constraints can be a barrier to boundaryless information flow. How can they be overcome or handled? Well, there's, there's two parts of legal constraints. <laughs> <laughs> One's the lawyers. <laughs> what, one is um, real legal constraints, and others are people telling you there's legal constraints just because they want to block information. Right. right? And we've been there. Um, so, if there are true legal constraints, um, like data privacy in, in, in Europe, um, then you, have to, you, you do have to obey the law, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you do have to protect information. Now, you can, you can integrate information and sanitize it in such a way that you can make, be aware of information but you can't um, pass it to third parties, necessarily. But within, within an organization, if you're within, say, the police force, if they're joined up, they can pass information around because it's the same organization. They're not passing it to third parties. Mm -hmm. If they're different organizations, and West Mersia Police is a completely different organization to the Metropolitan Police, then there may be a constraint on whether they can pass that information around. And that's a problem for the politicians, right? If, if I could jump in there, Steve. Uh, many years ago at, at GE, there was an example in the GE nuclear business where they got together and looked at all kinds of things that were constraining their ability to do business. And, and the people in the room said, well, we can't do this because, I mean, we're highly regulated. The lawyers won't let us do this. The regulatory commission won't let us do this. And they went through all these reasons why they couldn't do anything. And w when they actually sorted it through, they said, well, look, what are all the things you can't do? They found that many of those were things that their interpretations of what the legal constraints were and the regulatory constraints but it wasn't actually the legal and regulatory constraints. And they found that about 80% of it had been self-generated. Uh, so what happens in organizations is oftentimes you, it's, it's easy to blame the lawyers or blame the legal constraints or blame the regulators or say that's a convenient way to say we won't do anything. But oftentimes when you dig beneath it, you know, we, we, we interpret those in ways that, that leave us little room for discussion. 
but if you really talk about them, oftentimes there's much more flexibility than than we think there is. We see it often in, in merger integration, where you know we say we we can't do anything because the lawyers, you know, we can't we can't uh, share anything because of privacy. But if you actually talk about it and ask through, there's an awful lot that can be done, even in the constraints of the of the legal system. So uh, again, there I, I would just encourage the open questioning of those constraints as opposed to just accepting them at rote. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. There was a, a comment. Yeah, in, it it in was just for information, really. Um, in July 2016, the European Union will be announcing the introduction of a new data protection law. And large organizations will have two years to comply. Uh, should they fail to comply, then they could be fined up to 10% of their revenue. Yeah, mm -hmm. the EU likes the ten percent of revenue thing, doesn't it? <laughs> it's, uh, um, and I think it's going to get interesting that the, you know the recent kind of final nail in the coffin for safe harbour and, and data protection is going to lead to some really interesting situations uh, in the next few months. I think so. So uh, that, that's all the questions we have. Um, we're pretty much bang on time. So. Um, once again, I'd like to thank everyone for their, thank you all for voting, thank you all for the uh, uh, contributions and the questions, and um, mostly thanks to uh, Alan and Ron for the contribution and for being up so early in the morning, Ron, in Connecticut. Thank you very much. So, it was uh, my pleasure. Sorry I couldn't be there in person. I'd love to have a scotch with everybody at some point. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. ho hope, hope you can enjoy it without me. Yeah, we'll have one for you, Ron. Okay. Absolutely. Thank, thank, you for your, thank you for everything thank you leading much. up to this so. and including it. Thank you very much. Thank you.